My name is John Benson, and um, you are at uh, Bridging the Gap Between Technology and the Law. I apologize. Used to wandering around and speaking. Uh, what we're going to talk about today, we're going to look at some of the fundamental differences between the, uh, the, the world of technology and the, uh, the law and the legal community. Uh, we're going to take a look at um, some of the uh, perceptions and the level of adoption of technology, specifically some security technology uh, within the legal community and within um, with attorneys. Then we're going to turn to the uh, the real meat of the issue, and we're going to see how the uh, the the slow um, adoption rate and low level of understanding of technology um, plays out in um, in in trials and how it played out in Connecticut with the case of Julia Mero. So first who am I? My, like I said, my name is John Benson. I am an attorney. Um, I am not your attorney. Uh, nothing that I am saying here is uh, should be considered as legal advice. Uh, don't rely on anything that I say. Um, I'm also a uh, professor um, at, a, uh, at the Colorado Technical University in uh, North Kansas City there. But enough about me. Let's talk about um, technology and the law. Now, we have two contrasting worlds here. We have the technological world, which becomes more advanced every single day. Um, everyone is out um, writing new code, uh, new products are coming out, new exploits are coming out, um, changes every day. Um, the community thrives on this growth and its development. Now let's see how that contrasts with the law. The law, on the other hand, um, things don't change very much. Um, contrary to uh, uh, popular belief, sweeping changes in the law are extremely rare. Um, the, uh, the best example of sweeping changes as a result of a judicial decision would be uh, Brown versus Board of Education. Does anybody know here, here know uh, what that case involved? Yes, school desegregation. Um, that changed America fundamentally forever. However, that kind of decision that changes things that dramatically very rarely occurs. That was a very special circumstance. The law in general is very slow to react to new facts, new situations, and uh, I, 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 I even know that it hates things that are new and different. Uh, the law it, it, you won't like stasis. It likes staying the way it is and moves very slowly and incrementally. So we have two contrasting worlds. So why can't the law be different? It's very frustrating for us all to um, come to talks involving the law to find out what you all are doing, it, if, it's, if it's legal, um, what, uh, what, the, what the best practices are, and to have just about every attorney that gets up here say, Two things. First of all, you get the uh, the standard attorney answer to everything. It depends, and then you also get the standard answer, at least with uh, law and technology, of we just don't know yet. And it's extremely frustrating. You look at um, some issues like active defense, which have been topics of conversation for a number of years, and we still really have no idea what is proper, what is improper. So. What we have in the United States and Canada and um, the UK and the Republic of Ireland is the common law system. And within the common law system, there is a concept called um, stare decisis. And what that gives us is precedent, meaning that the decision of one court will be binding on similar facts in the future. What that means is you can take a look at previous cases, much like all the, uh, all the cases that um, Robert Clark put up on the screen today, and you can make analogies and see whether your actions are conforming with what the law has said there. And that is very reliable. You can, you can rely on that case law. In fact, that's what attorneys do every single day. What this does is it creates stable law. Um, it's, it's very predictable and it moves forward very slowly. Your facts may be slightly different than the case before it, and if your case goes all the way up through appeal 
and it um, is slightly different, then the law will take that into account and make a incremental change. Now, there is a different system out there called the civil law system, and it exists in continental Europe. And it's, it's, it's certainly different. There is no precedent over there. There is no stare decisis. Therefore, theoretically at least, you could have two cases coming before a court with the exact same facts and have the court come down in two different ways. That makes things very unpredictable. It also allows the laws to change and evolve much faster. Uh, you know, decide on your own what, what you prefer, but personally I prefer a law that I can predict as opposed to something that, that relies on um, constant litigation to figure out what you did, if that was proper or not. Another thing that is um, not understood very well in the United States is how laws are actually created. First, you have trials. And trials are not there to produce laws that are going to affect other cases. Trials are there to find facts. And then the, the judge applies the facts that are found by the jury to the law, and you get a result. After that case, um, in many cases, things are, um, oh, that's nice. In many cases, the case can be appealed. And it's a very common mis misconception that if you appeal a case, the appellate court will take a look at the case from scratch and essentially retry the case instead of in front of three judges instead of 12 jurors. That's simply not the case. If you, uh, you once the facts are established, they are established permanently. And the appellate level takes a look at how the trial judge applied the law within that trial and then will rule on whether that was proper or not. And it is the appellate level where the real meat of the law is made. Um, and the, the, the ironic thing is that with as, mu as many settlements that exist in, in law today, um, we still have a number of trials, but probably not enough, especially within this area. Because without trials, you don't have appeals. And without appeals, you don't have case law. So it's, it's going to take a long time for us to be able to establish what the guidelines are. But this will, this will improve. Over time, things, uh, the cases will be developed. And even though you won't find cases on point, you'll be able to figure out kind of a pattern of where the court will rule in any given situation. And although a lot of, um, a lot of people think that the law is very confusing, it, it operates on real common sense. And it doesn't, it, it judges and, and, and the law doesn't uh, look very kindly on getting cute with the law. There's been a lot of discussion recently about using, um, you, you take the example of uh, getting a cease and desist order or having a lawsuit filed against you for pirating a piece of software. Uh, one that comes to mind is this, uh, this, this pinball game. And a number of individuals say, well, I didn't do that. Someone else did. They got onto my wireless router. And my wireless router was open to the world, so it could have been anyone. That, that's not really going to work. Certainly not for this crowd. As Mr. Clark explained earlier today, the people in this room are special and will be viewed differently under the law. And the idea that um, someone here would leave an open access point um, is is much like the uh, the head in the sand defense um, of saying, you know, I, I I took in my car and I let somebody work on it, and uh, then I drove it across the border from Mexico into the United States, and I never I don't know what's in it, but turns out I've got 50 kilos of cocaine. You're still going to jail. Too bad. So let's now turn to the way attorneys view technology and how they've how how well they've adopted it well who are we talking about when we talk about lawyers and judges 
most attorneys don't have a real deep understanding of technology just because of the um, the number of changes and how quickly technology has developed over the past 30 years. Um, the lawyers are spending their time being lawyers and not learning about technology. Um, and so they don't have that kind of understanding that many uh, that many of us do. And judges, for the most part, are, are even worse than, than the attorneys. Um, they're, they're kind of insulated from... Uh, um, uh, from the rest of the world and certainly from the technological world. They have clerks that do most of their work for them and, and um, things like this. Also, attorneys come from all kinds of different backgrounds. Uh, well, well, certainly you have um, uh, political science majors going into it. Um, people who graduated um, with me came from um, finance, sciences, a couple technology, um, but you can do anything. You can start with any kind of background and then go to law school as long as you've got a degree. And while there are a lot of attorneys out there that do understand technology, a lot of them get sucked up into the intellectual property arena. And nothing against those attorneys. That's good work and it, and it pays well. But everybody seems to go, be going into that instead of going into the trial area and the appellate area where they can use their skills to further the law and um, possibly help society a little bit more than um, writing software patents, for example. So let's take a look at, a, at, at some recent graduates, people that graduated with me. Most students do have computers at this point. In fact, I would estimate that the level of usage of laptops in class is higher within law schools than it is in any other discipline, simply because there is such a large volume of notes to take during class and, and, and it's very conducive for it. Um, I would think that whenever I started law school, about 60 to 70 percent of the people in my individual section had laptops, which was pretty surprising to me um, and very surprising to the school because every classroom had two plug-ins for the entire 60 person section. So um, at the time, most still, um, still use Windows, though that is changing. You know, adoption of uh, OS 10, just like with the rest of the world, is going faster. But one thing that is going to hold that up um, is um, that uh, the software that is used to take exams and increasingly take the bar exam is Windows only. Um, most of them still use Internet Explorer. They haven't heard of Firefox or any other kind of alternative browser. Most are not very security aware. I would sit in the back of the classroom and I would see people having pop-up ads come up on their computer all the time and it's like, wake up and realize that you need to do something about that. And it, it sets up bad habits that they're going to carry forward. And we'll talk here in a little bit about some of the, some of the requirements that the law puts on attorneys as far as keeping information confidential and attorneys need to be some of the most security aware of any group of individuals out there. Um, and I also noticed that uh, most don't pay much attention to uh, what they're sending over the wireless network, including their passwords. Now, within the legal community at large, attorneys love new gadgets, new things. Blackberries, Bluetooth phones, they love them. Anything that they think is going to make them more productive, they'll jump on that bandwagon. But I'm sure that we all here understand that, uh, you know, especially with things like Bluetooth, that's actually, uh, there's actually a good amount of risk that they're taking on by doing that. Bigger firms out there are more security aware because they have a dedicated IT staff, but smaller, medium sized firms will ignore a lot of that. So that's, that's a significant risk. Federal courts have adopted electronic filing. Whenever you make any kind of filing in federal court, you do it using PDF, which is fantastic. Um, and um, it, it's, it's, it's certainly pushed the, uh, um, pushed the rest of the legal community in that direction of, going, of the dream of going paperless. Now, attorneys have a very strong obligation to keep your information secret. Whenever you talk to an attorney, it remains confidential and remains privileged as long as he keeps it privileged. And if it is, if it does get out, if um, you have a privileged document that becomes uh, public knowledge, then it is no longer privileged at that point. It can then be used in court. 
against you, possibly. And it's, it's rather scary knowing that there may be attorneys out there, which I'm sure there are, operating their entire practice on outdated hardware using open wireless access points and just, you know, leaving their fly open completely for people to come in and take that and disseminate it. And then that information, first of all, is no longer privileged, and that is some very personal information of yours that, that is now in public domain. So that's, that's kind of scary. The attorneys are the ones that brought us this notice, which is somewhat of a holdover. Um, of course, my favorite here comes at the, uh, at the bottom in the, the bold and the italic saying, destroy all copies of, this, of, the, of the original message of this, which um, you know, it's, not, it's not a fax. So you can't just throw it in the trash or shred it. And um, I believe that uh, there's only one place in the world where email can miraculously disappear and be um, completely destroyed, and um, that's uh, somewhere on the eastern seaboard. It is prohibited. It is prohibited by the disclaimer. Well, how could we fix this? We could use encryption. Encryption is very easy to use. We have uh, whole disk encryption for laptops, um, wireless encryption. Um, all communications, of course, can be encrypted using PGP, especially email. Attorneys love email. And it's easy to use, and it's easy to implement especially for a small practice. On a, on a large scale, it can be difficult to, uh, to get a high level of adoption. But uh, for the small practice, it's probably a good idea. I think everyone in this room would agree on that. Which brings me to a uh, little uh, a amusing anecdote. I, um, I'm a member of a listserv of solo and small practice individuals from the state of Missouri. And in joining, I, I started to contribute a little bit, and I would sign my messages using my PGP signature. Um, and this is the uh, this is the response that I got from one of the uh, from one of the members. Nice to know that you have encrypted your message to our little family, even though he could read the message. And then he said, "Like we need to worry that Homeland Security will be now will now be watching because you posted to this little house." The house being the listserv, of course. Now, I'm sure that there may be some individuals who can shed some light on whether PGP signing and PGP encryption gives us uh, more attention, but I don't, if anyone wants to stand and give us that answer, feel free at this time. Um, but this is the, the, it, this is the kind of stuff that we're dealing with as far as understanding of security technology. Um, people see encryption or anything involving it and they assume that there's some nefarious activity going on and that 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 just that needs to change and and it will take time um, but uh, it is a serious concern going forward and uh, these solo uh, solo attorneys and um, smaller firms are the ones that are the trial attorneys they're going to be the ones that are on the front lines helping find the facts of the cases so that they can then be appealed and then make the laws. Trial attorneys require excellent advocacy skills. And part of the advocacy skill is having a, a, a firm understanding of the facts. And for the most part, attorneys have always done a very good job of whether it's, it's, it's something obscure like pharmaceuticals or tobacco or dealing with it with a broken crane, attorneys will learn what's going on underlying the case and, and be fine. But they're just, it, I mean, we, we see it with people outside, um, in the outside world all the time, that there's just something about these little boxes that makes people throw up their hands and say, well, I don't understand. And that's it. And just be fine with not understanding. And that's, that's very frightening, especially when attorneys who don't have enough of the knowledge get involved and start trying to find facts and cases. At which point we turn to the state of Connecticut versus Julia Merrill. How many people have heard about this case? Okay, fair amount. Very well. We'll give a little background. Julia Merrill was a um, substitute teacher in Connecticut and she was substituting a seventh grade class. Now, I am still young enough to remember what it was like to be in junior high, 
and I knew that um, when a substitute teacher came in to a junior high classroom, the goal of the day was then to completely torment this teacher um, and see if you could actually drive them over the edge. And, um, you know, I, did, I don't really know exactly what happened in that classroom that day, but kind of think about these facts within that perspective of the students doing everything they can to kind of take advantage of the, uh, the substitute being there and such. Now, when she got there, she, uh, she went ahead and accessed a couple, e uh, a couple sites on the, uh, the school's computer, including uh, AOL, email, and uh, Orbitz. And she let some students use a computer, and they, uh, they went to some hairstyle websites. Um, and they didn't choose wisely. And these websites installed some adware on the computer. And as we remember from the frightening days of using Windows 98, and using the internet before um, before anti malware um, and adware and spyware software become very very prevalent, um, you get infected with with pop ups and those pop ups can come from everywhere and of course, what happens those pop ups may start as something innocent and they keep coming and they keep coming, and all of a sudden you have pornography coming in and ads for for porn sites coming into the computer and what the what this folk the, the case is about is what she what one side wanted wanted to make it into is what she didn't do. Um, most of us in that situation would have known to turn off the monitor, turn off the computer, unplug the computer, something like something along those lines, any anything to uh, to to stop the children from from seeing this pornography. Um, she didn't do any of that, and I think that part of it. Uh, lies in the you know it goes back to uh, um, the the old message that you have whenever you try and shut down your computer that says it is now safe to turn off your computer. Um, you know, a lot of people, especially a substitute teacher using a computer that is not familiar to her, if she is not very computer literate, may believe that unless I do this properly, the machine will explode. I don't I, I don't know, um, but uh, unless it's safe, then I'm not going to shut off the computer. But that's beside the point. She didn't do it, and a number of students came up around the desk and she tried to shoo them away but some of them saw some of the uh, some, some of the pop-up ads on there and then word started to spread around the school because remember this is junior high and and rumors are, are rampant and it, it works its way up into uh, into the administration and um, then eventually she was charged with a crime she was originally charged with 10 counts of risk of injury to a child. Risk of injury to a child under Connecticut law brings with it a 10-year sentence in state prison. So originally she was looking at 100 years in state prison as a result of this. Uh, before the trial, it was reduced to four. So um, you know, right before the trial started, the, uh, um, the other charges were dismissed, but the, the, the trial continued. And something that I notice in a lot of media coverage of the law is that they skip over some of the extremely relevant information, like what exactly is this statute that this person was charged under? What are the parts of it? Do we understand? No, we, they just kind of cover other things. At any rate, here is the statute. Anyone who willfully or unlawfully causes a child under the age of 16 to be placed in a situation where the morals of that child are likely to be impaired shall be punished. Now, I'm sure many of you think that that may be, I don't know, vague, <laughs> broad, but my God, won't you think of the children? Well, now we have to break down some of these elements and find out exactly what that means. So, Willful under the statute, and this 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 comes, and this is actually explained to the jury in the jury instructions, is that willful means deliberately or intentionally. And this becomes very important as we analyze the actual decision of the case. It's not a standard of negligence. In in a, if there was a standard of negligence, we would be asking the question: Would a per, would a reasonable person under the same circumstances have acted differently, done something different to protect these children from seeing this pornography? which I think we can all agree that, yeah, under that standard, somebody, w most of us, certainly in this room, would have done something differently. But under the statute, because the standard is willfulness and not negligence 
or recklessness. If she was negligent, then she would not have been convicted of the crime. So let's take a look at some of the uh, some of the lawyering that went on during this case. The uh, the, the the local newspaper, the Norwich um, Bulletin, uh, was good enough to publish the entire trial transcript online, and I highly recommend it um, because it is full of lols. Um, so here we go. We have. Uh, were there any other images that had been placed on your hard drive on the day before that you saw at least in the file format? It's a direct quote. I will buy a beer for anybody that can tell me what that means. <laughs> then my favorite, which we all heard before, did she log on to any programs? And then I, I, I just I picture the uh, the prosecutor going through this case and 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 reading the forensics report and saying, "Wow, here's an opportunity to say something in court that's never been said before." <laughs> Specifically to what I am pointing at here, my understanding is this: www.vaginalcumshots.com. Specifically, this website again was accessed to that PC in Mr. Knapp's classroom. It gets better. Here's one of the questions posed by defense counsel. Were any of the adware, spyware, parasite, and viruses updated on or before October 19th? <laughs> now, some of you may have um, come to the talk last year about actually attacking um, malware online using its vulnerabilities, but something tells me that's not what this defense attorney was talking about. Um, then in the closing argument, the defense attorney, in an effort to really personalize himself with the jury and, and, and get a nice, big, warm, fuzzy feeling about how confusing this whole case was, he came out and fully admitted, I'm computer illiterate. So hold your questions until the end. Yes, it's. You know, I, I'm sure that he is a very nice man, and and has a, he has a, he has a long career, and a, a, a pillar of his community. Um, but as far as advocacy goes, it's it, it's certainly not strong. We're going to continue talking about this. Um, now I want to turn back to the prosecutor, and I want to talk about a, a line of questioning that I found probably the second time I was reading through the transcript that I found very suspicious, especially in light of some of the comments that he made outside the presence of the jury. And this is, um, he's, he's questioning the, uh, the school's information services director. To your knowledge, was the PC in question at the time infected with any viruses? Not to my knowledge. As a person involved in the computer field, do you know of viruses that would allow a computer to infect and cause those computers to access random websites against the user's wishes? IC director says, I haven't seen anything like that, nor have I heard of anything like that. <laughs> well, and, 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 and we all laugh because, and, and, and we've got his, he's got his own page all, all to, to his own. But what we have here is the prosecutor anticipating the defense on the part of the, um, the, the defense team. And he's going directly at it, and he's talking to a certified expert about this. So we have either the prosecutor who doesn't understand that a virus is different than adware, or we have a prosecutor who is taking advantage of the fact that the jury probably doesn't understand that either. And there hadn't been any definition of terms at this point within the trial. And most individuals, when they see pop-ups, they say the generic term, oh my god, I've got a virus. Not necessarily, as we all know. Viruses are different than worms, are different than adware, they're different than spyware, everything like this. So this was just very troubling to me because while the prosecutor was fighting, um, fighting to keep the uh, defense expert's testimony out, he actually mentions adware. He uses that term. So he appears to know the difference between a virus and adware. But 
is rather certainly disingenuous when he is asking this question. You guys agree? Yeah? Okay. All right, who, who, knows, uh, who knows what a leading question is here? Well, I know you do, you do, and you do. What is it? Okay, so, so you know what an open-ended question is, correct? <laughs> he has no choice but to answer yes or no. Leading questions are allowed only on cross-examination, and a good advocate uses only only leading questions. In fact, a good advocate, if, if you notice a, a good attorney at work in trial, when a direct examination is going on, you'll see the attorney conducting the examination off to the side, often behind the jury, next to the jury, and the jury has their eyes focused directly on the witness. Whenever an attorney is getting up and doing a cross-examination, on the other hand, he is in front of the jury. He's pacing, he's making a, a spectacle of himself, and he is asking all leading questions. He controls everything. He controls everything that the, that the jury hears, and the witness just kind of sits there and takes it and says yes or no because he has no question otherwise. And if you're dealing with a hostile witness, then if that witness says yes or no and then adds something, you can strike the additional portion from the record because he already answered the question and then went on. So the defense attorney in this case, when he was cross-examining the IT director, he asked 21 open-ended questions. Um, I, I, think he, I think he asked under 10 leading questions. And what that allowed was this individual to kind of ramble on and continue with his side of the story as opposed to the defense team pushing for their side of the case. Well, what about the evidence? What, what happened after the school district learned about um, what was going on in this, in this classroom with the pop-up ads and such? Well, the, the IT director in his testimony begins by talking about the, the, the firewall and the, and the network system that they have and the fact that they have a filtering system and all this. Um, but when asked what he did first when he heard about this, instead of checking the server and checking the logs, he went directly to the classroom and hopped on to the computer. Now, I'm sure any forensics experts can, can help me out with uh, you know, whether that's forensically sound or not. Um, but he had to do that because he didn't know the IP address of the individual computer. So, um, and he describes, you know, typing in IP config. Love that. Um, additionally, when he sat down, he went ahead and started going through the uh, temporary internet files, went through all the cookies to see where the where the um, computer had had been on the internet, and um, wrote some things down, and then walked back to uh, back to the uh, to the server and started checking things on there. Did he take the computer out of the classroom? No. So what does that mean? That means for the time between whenever he was on there and the time that they actually removed the computer, there was still pornography and those files saved on that computer. So any student, I'm sure that there are plenty of seventh graders, I know I probably could in seventh grade, could have tracked down the temporary internet files and seen everything that was on there, right? So what else? I'm not going to say a lot about the police investigator because this pretty much sums it all up. Did you examine the hard drive for spyware, viruses, or parasites? No. He did absolutely nothing to find out if there was any kind of exculpatory evidence on the computer, which he's required to do, and failed to do so. Um, in fact, no one, no one involved looked for any kind of malware until the defense expert got a hold of the machine. What am I doing on time? Oh, 10 minutes. So what about the computers? The school district was running machines with Windows 95 and 98 in, window, in, uh, in 2004. These, these machines had antivirus protection on them only. That's it. Now the filtering software. The filtering software resided on the server, of course. And in mid-September, by the IT director's own admission, 
the license on the filtering software expired, and he didn't remember to update this. Um, so until October 19th, when we have all of the porn getting through, um, there was no filtering going on at all. So really what you had in the school district was a ticking time bomb. Um, it could have happened to any teacher in any classroom. It could have happened to the administrators, for that matter. Um, so you can you can kind of think about, you know, who's more negligent, even though that's outside the statute, but, but think about who's really at fault here. And the IT director, I don't know, lacks some common sense knowledge. Does spyware and adware generate pornography? I'm not aware that they do. Pretty shocking. So now the defense expert. And this gets really to the, uh, to, to, to the meat of the controversy. Because as soon as the decision came out, and as soon as we all learned that she had been convicted, the defense expert primarily, um, among others, started talking about the fact that he wasn't allowed to testify. That there was all this exculpatory evidence that he had found that wasn't allowed to be presented in the trial. A lot of people got really mad. A lot of people made, started yelling a lot on the internet. Surprise, surprise. And this really isn't, it, it's, it's misguided. Um, that isn't really what happened. And that's why it's nice to actually go through and instead of believing what you're told in, 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 in news coverage, to do a little digging and find out what happened. Um, a lot of people, in addition to just yelling on the internet and on message boards, also called this judge, sent emails to this judge saying terrible things. I mean, what is that doing to you know the reputation of the technology community at large? Um, but clearly, those people aren't you know can't be talked to and probably won't be swayed by my talk. So, so why was it excluded? What was excluded, for that matter? Well, in court, as anybody that's testified as an expert will know, um, you have to give your testimony to the attorney that you're working for, who then gives it to the other side. When you get to trial, there are, no, there are none of these Perry Mason moments where there's the, the surprise witness or the, the, the surprise evidence. No, everybody except for the jury knows exactly what's going to happen minute by minute in the trial. There are no surprises at all. Well, the expert in this case didn't turn over his, his materials to the defense attorney at all until the day that he was scheduled to testify. Now, the reason that, um, that the judge excluded it um, is, is not just because it's a technicality, as many people have, have, have said. Oh, that's that, that whole procedure thing. No. The important thing with giving the evidence to the other side and with discovery between, uh, between opponents is that effective cross-examination can be done. Um, even though it is the state on one side of this and an individual on the other, think about if, 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 you were, uh, if the prosecution tried to pull the same thing and you were the defendant, um, you would certainly be outraged and you would feel like you had been deprived due process and deprived an opportunity to get a fair defense. And it's the same concept in reverse for the state. So, so that was the uh, that was the reason that they uh, that they excluded that evidence. And how much was it? Two hours of material. He had a PowerPoint presentation that he was getting ready to give, and didn't tell the judge, didn't tell anybody how long this was, at least from what I've read. And and you know, I, I don't think you guys want to sit here and listen to me drone on for another hour. You imagine what a uh, Thank you. Uh, you can you can you can imagine what a jury would feel like who's sitting there in jury duty and then has a computer forensics expert giving a very dry PowerPoint presentation for two hours after they've already sat through most of this trial. So the judge probably would have made him cut it down anyway. So did it make a difference that he wasn't allowed to give his PowerPoint presentation? Probably not. He actually gave his conclusions and made them very strongly, and probably made them more strongly than he would have in his presentation. Um, he mentions adware, and he mentions spyware numerous times. Now, this is the best part. It, re it really is. That just will floor you. 
when he's, he's, he's through with his, he's almost done with his testimony, and the prosecutor gets up to do his final recross. And like we were talking about with leading questions, well, let, let, me, let me read the, uh, the, the, the line of questioning here. Uh, is it there? No. 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 Well, at any rate, the prosecutor actually got up there and said, what is your conclusion? And the expert says flat out, I believe that adware and spyware infected this computer and caused it to make these requests independently. Yeah, the defendant did absolutely nothing wrong. Um, it was it was none of her fault. The uh, the school was the uh, was the organization who was in charge of maintaining this and maintaining these filters, and they failed to do so, and it was their fault. He he did what is. Uh, uh, technically within the trial advocacy field uh, known as um, pissing on the other side, um, which you do when you're asked an open-ended question while being cross-examined. So he did very well, but he had, he, had, he had destroyed any kind of credibility, I believe, with the jury and with any of the, all the other attorneys in the room by some of his actions and his fighting, fighting with the judge. So and I know that the, somebody in here will probably be called upon someday to be an expert witness. So let's go over a couple things not to do. Um, whenever you get up to give your testimony, start in the witness box. Don't simply walk up and choose a spot to go and, and wait for the judge to say go. Start in the witness box. There's a procedure for all of this because in a courtroom, the judge is in charge. Don't add your own commentary. Um, this is a direct quote. May I ask you a question? This is, and I'm not being disrespectful, right, I believe that, understand where I come from. This is analogous to a plane crash, and this is when the judge is, is telling the, the, the expert that he's not going to be able to give his whole presentation. That's, you don't tell the judge that he's wrong, ever. The judge is always right. The judge is always on time. Um, and then he goes on. He says, one more comment, and then I will go exactly where you'd like me. I feel like my hands are tied at this point. What purpose did that serve other than, than letting this guy kind of vent to a judge who clearly doesn't like him at all? Um, and, and rightly so. So, so what about the jury? So the jury heard all of this evidence. They they heard from this expert that 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 there was um, that there was adware, and it wasn't at the fault of the uh, of the teacher. Well, I think that they get so confused and, uh, by all this testimony and nonsensical questions that they misapplied the law. Um, there were some interviews conducted of the jurors who said um, we don't think that the, that she did enough. Um, she should have turned the computer off. She should have covered it up with something. And as we discussed much earlier, that's not what the statute says at all. And this is what can happen when juries don't understand and when poor advocacy happens to help them understand how to find the facts and how to render a verdict in this case. So who do we blame in this? In this? Obviously, everybody initially wanted to blame the judge, but I think the judge is, is the least to blame. Um, the, the school district, who, who was running old machines without adequate protection on them, um, that didn't update their filtering system, was clearly negligent in this. Um, the state shouldn't be pro pressing these charges anyway. I, there's, there's nobody in this room that, that, that I'm sure will we'll think that she should be prosecuted at all, let alone thrown in prison for 40 years. Um, the defense attorney, by his own admission, by saying that he is completely computer illiterate, is somewhat to blame um, because he just had no business being involved in the case. And finally, the expert, the, the expert for the defense. The expert for the defense was the person that could have kept her out of jail. And by not following the procedures that are required, by not playing along, by being a complete jerk to the judge and to the prosecutor, destroyed all of his credibility. And in reading his testimony, I am absolutely not surprised that the jury decided that guy is such a jerk. We're not going to listen to anything that he says. We're just going to do what we believe is right. And that ended up being wrong. So was the response warranted on the, on the part of the public? Um, it was misdirected. Um, blind rage against the judicial system as a whole by saying it's slow, by saying it's antiquated, 
um, by saying that these judges are wrong, that's that's completely ineffective. That's 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 not going to change anything. That's not going to make anything better. Um, the two communities need to start coming together and working together to hash out these issues and make the laws more stable and 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 work better to protect all of us in the long run. So where is the case now? Well, the judge has ordered a new trial, um, and in, in her decision she said, uh, the jury may have relied, at least in part, on false information. And she doesn't specify what that false information was. I have a sneaking suspicion that it may be related to that, that line of questioning that I identified either, but I can't, I can't speak for the judge. Um, and I'm sure that more expert testimony will be admitted. I'm sure that there will be a PowerPoint presentation given, but it would certainly be smart to at least find somebody else to give that presentation other than that expert witness because it's going to be the same judge and things will not go well uh, considering how well the judge likes this expert witness. So what will the new outcome be? Well, we still don't know. Um, you know, the, the issue of, of attorneys who, who don't understand technology and can't articulate the facts effectively still exists. Um, and Ms. Amaro has a, has a new attorney, um, but, you know, but we, we will have to see, and, and, and hopefully she wins. I, I know that the state has yet to drop the charges. So, um, so in conclusion, the issues that separate law and technology and the, and the, and the movement of the two worlds is not going to go away anytime soon. We're going to be living this, living with this for the rest of our careers. Um, attorneys need to have a better relationship with technology, and we need more people with a technical background in computers to go to law school. And when they go to law school, they need to take some interest in something other than simply intellectual property. There are other ways that you can leverage your skills to, to make a difference and um, and uh, to, to, to build a career. So using those, with those advocates in place, we will have better decisions, we'll avoid trial outcomes like this, and the laws that we have will make sense and be easy for all of us to apply. Um, if you guys have any questions, I'm out of time right now, but I will be in the other room. I want to thank you all for coming. It's been a pleasure.